Hello and welcome to Waldy and Ron's Adventures <laughs> with Birds, the podcast they couldn't cage. I'm Valdemar Janusczak, art critic of the Sunday Times, although I also answer to Valdi, Waldy, Val, and even Wally, whatever it takes. Now I'm actually in France at the moment, uh, deep in the south in the Languedoc, and I'm joined in these adventures with birds by the wonderful Ron the Birdman Bennett, the man who knows more about birds than birds know about themselves. Ron, how are you feeling today? Is it all going well? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, we're out on the, uh, my terrace uh, looking for birds coming through on passage. Uh, birds going back now to Africa uh, at the end of the summer. Um, I've only just come out here, but I've seen a couple of um, Montague's Harriers come through already. Uh, probably juvenile birds, I think. Juveniles tend to come through together. And a short-toed eagle, which is um, hunting locally still. Right. So... Um, uh, we're hopeful. What's that up there then? Is um, that there? There's a bird up there which I think is one of our local kestrels. Yeah, it's uh, a kestrel. Yeah, so one of yeah. our local birds. So we're standing on your balcony um, and we've got a sort of wonderful view of the Languedoc countryside um, stretching away in both directions there. So we've got, this is a great position, isn't it? Because you've got, you've got the mountains on one side, the sea on the other, and I presume a lot of birds that are heading now back to Africa for the migration, they pass right over your roof, don't they? They do, they do. Um, we can look uh, south to the Pyrenees, the big mountain of the Canigou, um, and um, the western end of the Mediterranean um, is, is a bit of a funnel for migrating birds. Uh, particularly at this time of year, just at the moment, uh, we're, uh, we're looking for honey buzzards. Oh. Honey, honey buzzard is a... Uh, summer visitor to Europe um, and arrives beginning of May and uh, towards the end of August it's going back to sub-Saharan tropical rainforests in Africa and so there's, there's big numbers coming through um, particularly along the coast but if the weather conditions are right we get good numbers here and I've seen um, some good uh, good gatherings up to about 25 birds in the last week or so here coming through. Mm. I think they're going back a little bit early this year. So 25 birds in one one flock? In one flock, what they call a mm. kettle quite often, um, mm. just like a spiral. They'll, they'll find a, a, a hot air thermal and they'll spiral up and other birds will come from seemingly nowhere and join them and you'll get a gathering. Now, so obviously we know buzzards well in Britain. How, how do you tell the difference between a honey buzzard and a buzzard? Well, they're not easy, let's be honest. But um, the honey buzzard is, uh, it's got relatively longer wings, a longer tail, quite a long neck and a small head. Um, and it, uh, when it soars around, it holds its wings not in a shallow V like uh, the common buzzard does. It, it, it uh, holds them slightly drooped. You just get the uh, the knack of what they call a jizz uh, yeah. of uh, recognizing them, uh, you know, in the field. They're, but they've got it. They need to be soaring around, really. But if you're seeing a group of buzzard-type birds this time of year, they're going to be honey buzzards. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. So the buzzards don't flock in the same way, do no, they? No, no. The buzzards. We've got local buzzards here, which will be with us all year, and. Um, they're just uh, twos, maybe three, if they've got a young one, then that's as many as you'll get. Um, so you do get one or two um, buzzards coming through, uh, northern birds, which uh, migrate through, and some, uh, like the sparrowhawk's another bird, which um, the sparrowhawk uh, in England is pretty sedentary. It stays in Britain all, all year round. But the northern birds from, say, Scandinavia, it's, it's too cold for them in the winter, so they come through here. Um, really next month, uh, it's a little bit early for them yet, uh, and they will find their way into uh, southern Europe mm. as well. But just to show you the sort of number of honey buzzers which you get here, um, <clears throat> in, um, on the coast they have a migration a watch point at a place called Lucat, Cap Lucat, and um, uh, I think it was the 17th of May this year, they had in between 11 and 12,000 honey buzzers came through in a day. Oh, that's, yeah. and, and those birds are funneling mm. up the western side of the Mediterranean and they will then spread out into uh, mainland Europe. How exciting. Yes, yeah, good stuff. So what else do you see in your garden then? I mean, um, a lot of things, I would think. Yeah, there's um, nightingales are... Um, uh, they're reluctant to leave cover, but they, they'll, they'll sing quite close to you. They arrive about the second week in April. 
um, and they'll sing to until about the end of June. Uh, but they're still here actually because they make a little funny little noise which you can hear from cover. So I know they're still here, but you can't see them. Right. Um, so You're that, good on bird noises, aren't you? Right? <laughs> oh, do, do me the nightingale in cover. Well, well it's a bit like they, it's, it's been known as like a, a farting noise. It's just oh. a little. So right. nice. <laughs> okay. But we get a little warbler here called a Sardinian warbler, which is with us all year round, and that's mm. a super little, little bird. And a number of other warblers which come for the summer, like uh, the um, uh, subalpine warbler, the melodious warbler, um, and Orphean warbler. Um, so there's there's quite a good variety. Um, and you but, get them all in your garden? Uh, some of them just pass through. Um, and they'll sing as they're on passage. Now, I in April, I had, uh, there's a super little one called the Benelli's Warbler. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I had about half a dozen separate birds coming through on passage, feeding as they come through and, and singing. They just make a little, um, a little trill, a bit mm. like a wood warbler. Um, this Benelli was a good man, wasn't he? He seems to have done a lot for uh, naming birds. He is, yeah, yeah. I don't know who he was, but um, I don't know his background. But of course, um, he's uh, an eagle is named after him, the Benelli's eagle. Which you get around here as well, don't you? Yeah, the Benelli's eagle is a very rare bird in France. There's only about 38 pairs, but it's a bird of the Mediterranean basin, really, um, of the, what they call the Garrigue. And we have a pair um, not too far from here, about 20, 25 minutes from here, which are very successful breeders. Um, <clears throat> they've raised two young in each of the last five years so 10 young in the last five years which is oh, brilliant that's fantastic um, and, popular... and, and the young have settled as well or well the young they what they're doing at the moment is they're putting um what they call um gps trackers on uh, all the young in france um and so they can see where the young ones are going to uh once they leave the um the immediate area the uh, the parents will encourage them to leave and um, about this time of year, maybe next month, um, and the young will start wandering around looking for territories of their own. But they'll, um, it's been found from these GPS trackers that the, the young wander all over the place, all over, right up to northern France, down into southern Spain, Portugal. Mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, like all young birds do, they will instinctively find their way back to where they were born and look to find a vacant territory. But not, not, not for a few years? No, um, I would say, I think probably with Benelli's eagles, it would be three or four years old. Right. The bigger the bird, the, you know, something like a, a golden eagle would be five, six years old before it mm. starts to breed. Would you be able to take me one day, not now, obviously, because we're on your terrace, but one day to have a look at these, the, these Benelli's eagles? Yes, indeed. I, um, they don't fly over here? Or do they no, they don't, no. Yeah. But... Um, the, uh, the National Bird Organization, the League for the Protection des Oiseaux, the LPO, which is the French equivalent of the RSPB, although by no means a, 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 a strong and powerful an organization, they, um, they keep a log which uh, Brendan and uh, I make entries into each time we go and see the, uh, the Benelli's Eagles. So they'll be starting their next breeding season in January. January, that's early, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they're very early breeders. Uh, mm. The female will be on eggs by the end of February, mm. which is much uh, earlier than, for example, Golden Eagle. Mm. Um, but they're, uh, they're, um, there's only, I think there's seven pairs in the Aero at the moment. Uh, but this pair is by far the most prolific breeders and the most studied by the sound of it yeah they're, they're great and mm. they're so easy to see and we're lucky because they're quite near the road <laughs> <laughs> that's my kind of bird <laughs> so what else i mean the, so that the, there are some specialities around here aren't there that's that's one that's one i would say we got the f the four most colorful birds in europe here uh, mm. which is the hoopoe oh yeah love which the hoopoe. you'll know yeah, yeah. um the bee eater the yeah. european bee eater the roller yep and uh, the golden oriole. Yeah, well, I've seen all those except for the uh, oriole this year. I, the blooming <laughs> orioles, every year I come down hoping to see loads of them, white, yellow, and black, or 
the male is bright yellow. It's difficult to see. I, they're, is it uh, just me? I'm a useless no, bird yeah, watcher. No, it's not your shoe value. You're, they're, they're, um, they, they hide themselves in the, the tree canopy very effectively. Um, so you'll pick them up almost certainly on uh, call, on song, really. Yeah. Well, do uh, us a song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play it to you, which is, which is easier. Um, but um, it's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, it is. It's a lovely song. And um, let me just get my bird app out. And um, they arrive in in early May. They're with us until about mid August, towards the end of August. Um, and they became they become quite um, vocal and they fly around a lot towards the end of the month. And so we I've had some good views. Um, so you get some uh, some good flight views of them. But this is a song I'm going to hopefully. Yeah. This is one. There's two birds singing there. Yeah. It's a little bit, a little bit like a blackbird, isn't it? In, yeah. the, in that sort of melodious sense. Yes, know. it is. Um, there's another bird singing it as well, which. Then there's a call which is a sort of. A cat-like call. Yeah, funny call. Actually, yeah, I heard. I heard. You know, I heard a weird noise this morning when I woke up. Well, obviously, one of the big things about the lockdown is everybody's been talking about the birds singing. Yep. So you hear them better, don't you, when the cars you are stopped? But um, I heard. Um, I think it must have been a kestrel, but it was a wild screech, six in the morning. I, honestly, it sounded like a cat. I don't know what it was. It was something I haven't heard often before. But we've got a couple of kestrels nesting in our church as well, mm. and it just. It was just like. a you know, the real screech. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't like. I wouldn't like to say what that is. No, no, it's not very good. Uh, uh, not a very good impersonation, uh, is it? <laughs> but talking about, um, uh, yeah, birds of prey. Uh, France is a lot better off than the UK for birds of prey. The UK is fairly impoverished, really, possibly because of the Channel, I suppose. But here, in in addition to the ones you would expect in the UK, we we get the black kite. Oh yeah, which is a widespread species, goes right across to Hong Kong and beyond. Um, we get the booted eagle, which is a, a, a nice bird, a small eagle, which comes in two color forms, what they call a dark morph and a pale morph. Quite, quite a, a difficult bird to see here. We, again, in this part of France, we get them on passage, spring and autumn. Falcon wise, we get the lesser kestrel. Oh, which is yeah. a slightly smaller version of the kestrel. That's another tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. To, um, yeah the, the, they're colonial oh. breeders, and there's there's a village not so far from here called Saint Pons de Marchion. Oh yeah, Saint Pons. Uh, yeah, 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 where there's uh, they get over a hundred pairs breed together. A hundred pairs. Mm. Yeah. I, and I've seen them, but it's the sort of thing because it's they're tif just difficult to tell unless unless there is a flock of them, isn't there? And yeah, they are. There. They're very they're, they they feed more like uh, a hobby, mm. um, which is uh, an insectivorous. Uh, Falcon, which feeds on the wing rather than hovering. They don't hover. Uh, Do they hover at all? A little bit, yeah. Right. But at Saint Pons de Marchion, they, they you can see them. You can get up to roof level of, of the houses, and you can see the birds going under the roof tiles. Uh -huh. And they'll sit on the gutters quite often, and you can see the features of the lesser kestrel. Right. One of which is a grey panel in the wing, and the the blue grey. Uh, head and uh, various other things. Yeah. Um, so that's a good, a great place to go. To. And Saint Pons de Marchion is the biggest colony in France, I believe. Yeah. And they've got, it's got so big now, it, they're spilling out into other villages. Oh, that's exciting. I know uh, I've spoken to you a few times this summer, and you've been very excited by your sightings of um, Eleonora's falcons. Now, that's a bird that seems to be popping up a little bit more frequently down here. Yeah, they. Um, I think it's being found more, and I think it's. Uh, I've really only got onto them in the last couple of years, but the Eleonora's falcon is a, again, a summer visitor to Europe, but it doesn't breed in France, although I just found out that it used to, apparently, but um, mm -hmm. it's a bird which breeds um, on offshore islands in the Mediterranean. That's right. I mean, I've, and, I, I've uh, seen a few in the past, but in, I think it was Formentera or, you know, Ibiza yeah. even. It's, That's it's right. the Balearics, isn't it? That's yeah, where you Balearics, get them normally, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, there is a, an island just off, uh, Mallorca called Dragonera, which is a nature reserve, and that has a colony of a colonial breeders, a bit like the Lesser Kestrel. Uh, that has a colony of over 100 pairs. But they're uh, an interesting bird because they delay their breeding season to coincide with the autumn 
migration of what they call passerines, small birds, which are moving back to Africa, warblers, chats, flycatchers, that sort of thing. And so these small birds are uh, flying over the sea and they'll come to a, an island like Dragonera. And I've seen uh, video footage of them. Uh, the falcons will just come out from the, uh, the breeding colonies and just take these birds off, the, off just above the sea. Hmm. So easy, it's unbelievable. They're very late breeders. So now they will be, young will just be hatching on, in the Eleanor's falcons nests. Right. But they won't be nesting in France, or they no, will? No, no but yet, the no, birds we're no. seeing in France yeah. are non-breeders, probably mostly young birds, what they call second calendar year birds. And so they're, um, uh, they're just coming up for the summer. And um, I was reading the other day about uh, uh, a site, a particularly favoured site in, uh, in the Gard, which is well away from the where you would think in the um, near the sea, mm. and uh, this guy there watches them, and he's had up to eighteen together <coughs> in the summer. I mean, July and August are the two peak months, <coughs> and then yeah. they'll leave here in early to mid September, and they all winter in Madagascar. In Madagascar, yeah. And wow. uh, again, they've so we go across Africa <laughs> from the Balearics. Yeah, yeah. And they fitted GPS trackers to young birds, uh, and they'll go independently right across uh, mainland Africa to, and find their way to Madagascar. That's extraordinary. It is, yeah, yeah. just by instinct, you know. Yeah. And it's not the parents taking them. The young, yeah. the parents will leave before the young. Uh, the parents go by the end of uh, September, and the young stay on a little bit longer, learning to. Um, to hunt and things and they'll follow independently like a lot of birds of prey do like ospreys for example you know young ospreys uh, find their own way down to west africa which is a strange sort of survival yeah. strategy really isn't it yeah. well it is to me if, if you compare it with for example ducks and geese and swans you know you get the swans like the hooper swans and the buick swans come as a family party to the UK for the winter from Iceland and Greenland and whatever. Yeah. And the adults are teaching the young ones the stop offs and the and, and the win and, and the wintering areas like Slimbridge and places like that. Birds of prey have a completely different strategy. I used to know an artist whose name was Kerry Trengrove and um, he was a really nice guy. Passed away unfortunately now. But he made a whole series of artworks about the uh, Mauritius kestrel. Okay. Which at the time was, uh, like, was yeah. something like the rarest uh, bird yeah. in the world, or something. Mm. It was there was only about ten of them left. And I remember he went out there, and he, the, you'll laugh, but the way he used to make these these artworks is he would collect droppings from um, Maurice Kestrels, and then sort of bake it and turn it into a kind of charcoal, and then do drawings with them. Great, so yeah. the drawing was actually with this sort of brown organic material, which happened to be dropping. But they were lovely things. And I, and I got a grant. I remember he went out there about 10 times and, um, you know, saw these rare kestrels a yeah. few times. I got a but, feeling yeah. with Mauritius kestrels. I, mean, I think they, they started a, a captive breeding program, didn't they? I think because there's been a return. They've they got yeah. better. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I think it was a bit like they'd done with the Californian condor. It was with the, the condor. They, um, I think they got down to 20 or so individuals. That was the whole world population. So they decided to bait traps and capture the last remaining 20 or so, breed them in captivity, and then slowly release the young back into the wild. And I think they, they did that with the Mauritius kestrel, I believe. Yeah. And, and save the species, basically. There you go. Yeah. Um, well, it's quiet on here tonight. It's not not, not a yeah. lot up there, is there? No, you got, it's no. You got to look around. You got with, the curse of uh, Valdemar. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think it's a fairly quiet. I had a couple of black storks through the other day. Oh, really? Uh, which is uh, quite a rare bird. The white stork is uh, is the one which uh, in folklore carries the baby. Okay. The black stork is more of um. Yeah, white storks breed on uh, roofs of uh, houses. They've been breeding in Britain, haven't they? Yeah, the they've released years, them. First time. Yeah, they've yeah. released them. Uh, but, the, but the black stork is more of a wild species in terms of it It needs peace and quiet and um, breeds in secluded river valleys. Mm. It's, it's slightly smaller than the, the white stork. Um, and I would normally, on a good autumn, I would see three or four. But last autumn, for some reason, no one's ever explained it to me, I saw between 50 and 60 black storks came through here. 
and and it was interesting because they were going they were circling around a lot of them and they were going down into the vine fields mm. now what for feed well i can only think it's grapes yeah really there's nothing else there for, you know there's, uh, well it's a good vintage let's face yeah. it last year <laughs> <laughs> and so um the ones i saw close enough were young birds the young mm. birds haven't got the bright red bill of the adults they've got more of a, a sort of fleshy pinky bill um so they're very distinctive in flight aren't they those stalks yeah, they they're like a sort of crucifix very yeah. sort of pointy at all ends aren't they you yeah. get big numbers of white stalks um go down the coast particularly there's a, a very uh well-known um migration point uh greece on which the lpo um man from the end of july right through to the end of september maybe into october it's called the rock roc and they man it every day and you can look up to see what they've seen every day yeah. so a day like today i would think with a northwesterly wind there would be good numbers of honey buzzards there yeah because the the the, the northwesterly wind, the tramontan blows the birds towards the coast they don't want to be over the sea because there's no thermals so they'll funnel down the coast and they'll they'll um follow it all the way into yeah, spain around to spain yeah so um yeah. Uh, Grison uh, yeah. is a hot spot, um, and they get Eleonora's falcon uh, quite regularly there. That's a good spot for them as well. There are all sorts of things. That's all those places like Perpignan, past Narbonne, that way. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good art country, of course, oh, down yeah. there as well. Dali, Salvador Dali is nearby. Oh, yeah. oh exactly. Coyor, Matisse used to go yeah. painting Coyor. It's a lovely yeah. part of the world. But um, some of the birds like uh, the honey buzzers and the bigger the eagles and stuff go over the Pyrenees. Other birds will stick to the coast. But uh, there's a well-known migration um, watch point in the Pyrenees, uh, the Eastern Pyrenees here, which I've been to for the last couple of years, called N, E-Y-N-E, -E, uh, which is a great place to be. And you just go and sit in the middle of a, a grassy meadow with um, mountains either side and it's a pass basically and all the birds are funneling through this pass and I went last year with a friend and we went for two days and we had over 2,000 honey buzzers in two days. Phenomenal isn't it? Yeah and, uh, and, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, quite a lot of them, particularly early in the morning, mm. are at, at eye level. Yeah, uh, no. At eye level uh -huh. before the thermals get going. Yeah, uh, and other stuff exciting. with them as well, marsh harriers going through, mm -hmm. um, and smaller birds like bee eaters, um, and we even had three lammergeyers together. No, right. they don't migrate, do they? they don't, but no, these were local birds. Yeah, two yeah. juveniles, the dark ones, and the adults. Yeah, ah. I've seen a couple of those uh, driving up into the into Spain from uh, from France. What a bird that is, the oh, it, is. it is. It's a gorgeous thing, big and pink, and oh, they are so exciting. They are super birds, yeah. yeah. There's a there's a program, a reintroduction program, as you might know, now into the Massif Central, uh, into the Cévennes, uh, based around uh, the Gorge de Tarn and the Gorge de la Jante. So they're releasing captive bred lammergeiers annually, mm. three or four every year, and they're putting GPS trackers on these birds. And the, the idea is to create a link between the recently introduced and now breeding um, alpine population and the Pyrenees population. Right. So the yeah, birds right, will yeah. connect. Um, connect between the, and yeah, and um, move around. And um, but there's a Mediterranean population. I know that because I've seen them on Crete. I remember seeing them on Crete. Yeah, First Lamagar I saw. Corsica, there yeah. as well. So how many vultures do you get in France then? So you've got. Griffins, don't you? The griffin vulture is, is the common uh, European vulture. And um, I'm not sure the French population, it's in the hundreds. Mm. Um, so there's a population in the Pyrenees and the Alps and in the Massif Central. They were reintroduced into the, uh, the Cévennes, I would uh, really. Uh, they were introduced there some years ago and the population now is about 300 pairs, I think, of griffin mm. vultures there. And you'll get quite a lot of movement between the Cévennes and the Pyrenees, mm. and birds come over here. Um, you seen them here? Yes, yeah, seen, them over, really? seen, seen yeah. them over the village. Yes, threes and fours normally. Yeah. Um, and I think they're young birds, which are looking for new territories. Yeah. There's a gorge just up the way, the Gorge d'Eric, uh, where yeah. they, uh, they are now roosting wow. nightly, and they'll yeah. go out and feed in the day, and then come back. Yeah. So you've got Lamagaya, you've got the Griffin, 
Egyptian yeah. vultures at all? Yeah, they're a rare bird. The uh, the Egyptian vulture, small vulture. There's only I think the, the French population is generally about sixty pairs. Mm. But they're a summer visitor to uh, to France to Europe, um, unlike the other vultures. Um, so uh, there's a, again a Pyrenean population and in the in the Cévennes. But only two or three pairs in the spent mm. uh, and they've only started breeding there recently where they've been attracted through the presence of griffin vultures there um, but i saw uh, an adult egyptian vulture came over the house uh, <laughs> in march this year wow. which wow which is one of my birds of the year so far that's exciting and, yeah. yeah it was superb but yeah. uh, the other one of course is the black vulture Right, I've not seen that. Yeah, black vulture is again. They re reintroduced into the Seven a little bit later than the Griffin vulture. They don't do anything like as well. And I think the the Seven population is about twenty five pairs at the moment. Bigger, even bigger mm. than the Griffin vulture, and a very short tail, a very distinctive bird. Mm. Uh, but I've seen them up in our regional park up here. Up in the mountains. Yeah, in the we have we have the regional park of the High Languedoc up yeah. there. Oak um, Languedoc. Yeah, you've yeah. got eagles there, golden eagles, of course. Yeah. Golden eagles up there, and um, if you can find them, which is they're not easy to find. <laughs> but um, I've seen uh, griffin vultures you see quite regularly up there, and I've seen black vulture with them a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. right. Everybody's got a sort of favourite bird, haven't they? I mean, just the, just the one that really gets the heart ticking. What, what's yours then? What's, 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 ah. what's Ron the Birdman Bennett's dream well, bird? The bird, I think the best bird I've ever seen, I'm a, I'm a, a raptor fan, really, basically. Mm. So all my top birds are raptors, really, apart from, say, the nightjar, which I love. That's the super bird. Um, the swift. The Alpine Swift is what it is. It's a magnificent bird. Yeah, but, so um, nice. but I would say my favourite bird I've, I've ever seen is the Barrow's Eagle, the African equivalent of the Golden Eagle. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, I've not even heard of that. No, it's uh, <laughs> they're super birds. But uh, uh, currently, I, I would say Golden Eagle is my favourite here in France. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with um, trying to find the nest of a Golden Eagle. <laughs> Up in the Haute Languedoc. Yeah. They're up there, but no one, I don't think anyone's going to tell me where they nest. So I'm going to have to find it myself. Um, so we're working on it. Maybe the next time we do this podcast, Ron, uh, you, you'd have found them. Next next spring. Or next spring, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you, as always. Lots of chirping suddenly starting up above us. But uh, there's some birds out there. We've just got to find them. That's it's always the truth, isn't it? And I don't seem to be cursed. I never can. But with you by my side, Ron, who knows? Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> no, it's been Til good fun. Uh, it's always great to talk birds. It is. Until the next time. <laughs> okay.